this is an X-rated. This is X-rated. The kids can't be in here. Is that all right? Amen. You know what X-rated is, right? This is extra powerful. I mean, where was your mind? What were you thinking? Mm, now we might make some points. When you hear words, your mind goes somewhere, don't they? All right. Well, let's go ahead and let's just get started. I want to talk and I want to yak. I really do. Well, I think I will for a minute. I just don't want to go too long. Pat, I give you permission to say, Pastor, that's enough. Preach. Okay. But listen, while I was gone, I had a time in God. I've been ministering as much gone as I have been here. You probably thought I was out vacation and that was my intent. And then one day, one day, I'm not joking. I went out, sat in a chair, and they got umbrellas and chairs lined up in front of where I stay. So I went and sit there. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm just sitting out there just praying and just enjoying the crashing of the waves. And I noticed there's nobody. And I'm going, this is weird. There's nobody out here. There's always people. And so I just got my little cell phone and I popped it up and I just videoed the beach. And it hit me. There is a rapture. Hallelujah. And I saw everybody was gone. There was nobody. And I said, thank you, Jesus. There is a rapture. And thank you for not taking me. And so I was so disappointed when I found out everybody was still there later. So anyway, for just a few moments, I wanted you to know I had a great moment of joy when it looked like there was nobody but me, God, and the beach. And then everybody showed up. Oh, well, I know you're disappointed. It, it, it hasn't happened yet. Don't worry about the rapture. I do so many funerals, I wouldn't be concerned about the rapture. You need to be concerned about your life when you leave this world and you need to seek his appearing and not your disappearing because the Bible says those that seek his appearing shall see him and if I was a devil I'd say why don't you seek your disappearing yeah that's a good idea devil I'm going to come up with doctrine to disappear I, I want to focus on him up here how do I do that we're going to get into it you ready recap from where we were we must put God's word in our heart if you want to know what he's thinking because God's words are his thoughts put down into words and once expressed with vibration, with vocal cords, it has the power and the anointing in it to produce faith. Now, faith is so powerful. Jesus said, if you talk to a mountain and told it to be cast into a sea and did not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you said with your mouth was going to come to pass he said even you would have whatsoever you say oh that's powerful people oh mountain moving faith and so people want to learn faith they want the faith to move mountains and then the next thing you know they got a problem with somebody and they're mad and they're angry and they're so mad i don't want to forgive them you know what they've done to me and you don't realize if you can have faith to kill a real fig tree and faith to cast a real mountain into a real sea what would that be about to show you the power of forgiveness because the next verse in mark 11 and 23 where he's making it clear you have what you say believe in your heart doubt not believe what you say gonna come to pass you have whatsoever you say you do have what you say when you believe it doubt and unbelief if you believe it it's still you have it Nothing works for me. It'll never get any better. I don't care how hard I try. <laughs> I take one step forward, it's like 10 steps backwards. It wouldn't make, if I go to plant something, it'll die. I'm telling you, man, I can just go to drink water and it's polluted before. You ever hear people talk like that? They have no idea, have no idea that they're pouring gasoline on a real fire. God gave you fire. His word is fire. Hello, and the same fire as Clarice taught us that cooks your eggs can burn your house down. You better know how to hold your fire. Are you all right? So I'm doing a little recap for the time I left, but after listening to Jordan, and boy, I had a time with that. You know, I didn't get him until Monday. 
As a matter of fact, when I was telling y'all about the fire, I was listening to Jordan during that time when nobody was there. It was just me and Jordan and God. <laughs> and he had me so excited, that little bald-headed fella. I'm telling you something about bald-headed people, it bugs me. But anyway, he, he was just on fire and, and he looked like a Mennonite with the beard, hadn't seen his beard. And I'm going, Jordan. And then he started preaching, you gotta dance in the rain. I said, oh my Lord. Oh, what a word. And if y'all going through anything in life, <laughs> then you, except I felt like for me, I'd been dancing in a hurricane rain, but that's okay because I was dancing. Are you all right? Amen. So when you put your thoughts, God's thoughts in your mind, what's this? You put his purpose in your mind. You hear people talking all the time. I wonder why I was born. Why am I here? Have you not noticed there's a lot of things you don't have to ask for? Like to be born? Or how about to die? That's not even a request. Why? Because you have destiny and purpose. The Bible teaches that we're a seed out of God. He teaches us in Mark 4 that the sower goes and sows the word and the word is the seed, the seed of God. And we sow it into soil, you. And if you're bad ground, It'll still try to come up, but your bad ground will choke the roots. But if your heart's tender and you're ready, and that seed gets in, it'll root real quick and grow. And the next thing you know, you had bare land and you was in poverty. Now you jacking the beanstalk, baby. You flying up through the clouds. Gonna kill the giant and take his egg. You all right? His golden egg. Y'all probably don't remember that. I'm so old, that's an old story. But anyway, I think his name was Jack. He's not as important as Jesus. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. But see, when you get in the Bible and you look at these words, you're literally looking at the unseen Jesus. When you listen to the word, you're listening to an unseen Jesus. The Bible, the word of God, takes a whole complete place of an invisible God. If you closed your eyes, everything you can hear and that's happening is invisible. You can't see it, but it's happening. You can close your eyes and still listen to me. You can't see me. Now I'm invisible to you. What are you hearing? Words. And even if you opened your eyes and I run behind a curtain where you couldn't see me, you'd still hear my words. And so it's the words of God that cause your life to change drastically. Listen, James chapter 3, your tongue is just like the rudder on a ship, wherever the captain wants to go, he sets that little tiny rudder. And that ship may plow straight for a while. But if he leaves the rudder where it's supposed to be, he keeps saying what he's supposed to be saying, the ship eventually begins to turn. That's true in the natural and the spiritual. You are a seed out of God's mouth. He has planted himself in you. But he can't grow unless you water and fertilize him with the washing of the water of the word of God. Boy, it's so quiet in here, but I feel like daddy's sitting at the fireplace. Son, just throw another log on the fire. We're going to be here a little bit. So we put the word first place in our life. If we don't, we will be last. You have to put the word first. I listened to my own message. And I preach to myself. Now, I don't even like to hear me. I really don't. I hate my voice. Don't like the way I look. I have to, I just go through it to listen to the words. Because the words are what's important. How you look is not as important as your words. Are you hearing me? Your words matter. Your words matter more than you would ever imagine. And the enemy wants you to set your ship on the wrong course. Say the wrong thing. And you're the captain of the ship. And that rudder is going to go to what you said. And then when your ship ends up in lost harsh waters, why would you get mad and cuss God when God tried to tell you, don't take your ship out there? But we do. But he can handle it. Everybody that's ever got mad and cussed God, he didn't freak. I can see people, oh, you hear him, coach God. And God's going, he's immature. He doesn't know or she and when they come to the revelation oh my god are they going to be awesome that's the way god is 
He sees you flipping and flopping on the bank trying to get to the water. And he's going, you know, maybe I just have to wait on them to quit flipping and I'll just pick them up and ease them in the water myself. And we just struggle, struggle as hard as we can to get to the water. Oh, church. God's got so much water for us. And we're the love of his life. Listen, God loves you more than you could ever love your mate. He loves you more than you. I met for the first time. Now, in two more days, I met my wife. Well, I got my first kiss. September the 8th. Three minutes after 11 o'clock at night. She supposed to already been in the house three minutes ago. I just give her a ride home. She kissed me. Wow. Well, she always marked that day was when we met. But I remember two days before when we come pulling up at her house in a 1968 green super sport Chevelle and the guy driving it, his last name was King. And so the King says, I'm going to show you a chick that is hot. And boy, I got a date with her. He said, you check her out when she comes in. Now get in the back seat. So I got in the back seat. And this blonde-headed girl come running down them steps. And when she opened the door and got in the car, she didn't sit in. She got in with her knee, put her knee in and looked and had a pack of juicy fruit. Slid one out, leaned over to sit. Didn't even talk to the king. Leaned over and said, you want a piece of gum? I wanted to snatch the whole pack out of her hand. And I was real sweet and kind. I sat by there and smiled. And, and I said, no, thank you. I don't chew gum. And I don't. I said, no, thank you. And so <laughs> I didn't see her no more. But Lord have mercy, two days later. I know what you think I'm off track. I'm talking about how much God loves you. Two days later, I'm sitting in first party shop. I know Christians are not to be there. I totally agree with you. I didn't see any of them in there. And so I'm sitting in first party shop. And the Army recruiting station is next door. I'll tell y'all something about me that sounds bragging, but y'all don't even know this. It does sound braggish, but here's, here's why I was there. I know what you think. Why were you in an Army recruiting station when you were in the Army and you met her? How, what's going on? Well, one day I was just called into the office. And they said, Sergeant Souls report. And I did. I went in. I did my thing. Sergeant Souls report. Dude said, and he said, Sark Souls, you have been chosen out of 1,500 men as the top soldier in our battalion. And I'm standing there going, I did? I'm serious. What? No goal, no intention, not trying. He said, all we want you to do is go to your hometown, sit in the recruiting station, and everybody that comes in to join the military we want you to tell them about this division you're in, this infantry unit, and what it provides, and see if they would be interested in going in the infantry. I said, y'all want me to do that? So they give me a Gran Torino, military driver's license, and TDYP, I mean, I got a lot of money. And I come home with my beret on and my uniform, and I'm strutting in my stuff. I'm 19 years old and I'm a sergeant. And I, they, nobody in the whole world knows I've been picked out of 1,500 men in a battalion that's a top dog. And i just glad to be home. I'd been on the DMZ in Korea. Man, I'm happy. I'm, I'm glad to be home. And then I see that woman. Oh, Lord have mercy. Changed all my military ideas. I was, I, had so much, I was the youngest sergeant in my unit ever in history. So I thought I'll just stay in. And man, I'm really going to make it in the military. Starting off young and getting out. But when I seen that woman and I said, I said, I'm going to stay in the army. And I said, what do you think? And she said, I don't want to be a military man's wife. I don't want to do that. And I said, okay. <laughs> we'll just dump it. Amen. I didn't pull my time. Let's get rid of them and let's go with her. When we realize that God cares so much about you that he can be as silly over you as I am over Kathy. I'm telling you. I did a funeral yesterday for Pat Dockery, a good friend of mine. Y'all know the Dockery's probably. Been coming here from Gastonia for 25, 30 years. Drive the 57. She has the 55. She's one that leaves the black marks out there. 73 years old. Eee! Going out the driveway. My wife went, oh my gosh. And Pat just grinning that 55. Well, she went, she went to heaven. So her and Kathy, Kathy's showing around this morning. Can I get an amen? 
did our home going yesterday and it was so good. It was. This something go to a funeral and say it was good. It, you know, when God's in your life and you, you depart this old world, even your funeral's good. Isn't it the truth? Well, I better move on. I'll get into Pat and all that. But listen, I speak peace to the Dockery family today. The service was phenomenal. So many people came to Christ yesterday. In the last moment of the thing that was done in the world with her, she took her family and some souls to heaven. Gosh, I could just keep talking. Y'all don't know how I could keep talking. I could tell you some stories with that woman that blow your mind. They said, my daddy's not saved. Will you talk to my daddy? And I said, yeah, I'll talk to him. So I drive the gas, don't you? And then I get in their car and they drive me over to his house. And they tell me about him and they just tell me he doesn't really like preachers much. And he's, he's this, he's a little hard. And so we get there and I'm going up to the door. They're going back to their car. I said, what are you doing? And they drove off. They did. They drove off. And if you're watching Jerry, you know it's true. They drove off and left me there. He knocked, I knocked on the door. And the man came, and I'm thinking, now what did she say his name was? And he opened the door, and, and all I could think of was her. And I said, you know Pat Dockery? He said, that's my daughter. I said, yeah, it's a good friend of mine. I know her. That got it started. And uh, he invited me to come in and make a long story short. He ended up, he and his wife, accepting Christ. And they did. They both got born again. I was in there a long time. And then I come out of the house, and they're still not there. I'm like, this is weird. Why didn't they go in with me? So finally here the car comes down the street. I go and get in the car. Why did y'all drive off and leave? I thought we were all going in together. And they said, are you kidding? He's crazy. We, we thought that he would get his gun or something. And we weren't going to be there when the bullets start flying. And I said, dude, you drove off and left me? And, and they said, we knew you would have it. And I thought, you did? Hey, anyway, got born again. So that's, that's the thing I got to say to Jerry. I said, I wonder who the first person that your wife said hey to. Well, he started off with her daddy and her mama. And he worked down a little list. And his last words in the list was, and that's after she sees Jesus. All right, I, I rabbit trailed. I told you a little story, but that's a wonderful family. A lot of history here, and Pat's going to be tremendously missed. But let me tell you something. Now, that was a woman of faith. That man, laid, this is the message of preaching right here. He laid in the hospital a year ago with cancer and not going to live, going to die. I'm talking about according to all the rules and everything. There's no way out. His wife stood at the door. This is before Corona. You could actually go to the hospital. And she stood at the door, wouldn't even let family members in. And she'd stand there, she had a raspy voice. And she'd say, you're not going in there and speaking down and unbelief over him. I done spoke the word of God over him. And he's covered by the blood of Jesus. And he's going to come out of there. And she kept doing that and doing that. And he kept getting better and better and better and better. And he went through Hades. And that woman fought for him. And you say, yeah, but, but she just died. Well, you all will. Don't be shocked. It, what it is, is we learn to live in faith and we learn to live in healing and have a long life. But there is a day that it will end. And when it does, sure, up, we don't want to lose anybody. We want to, we're all selfish about each other. But come on, church. It's eternity. This is only a few spots of seconds out of what began and what's going to end. This isn't a long time. Are you all right? And Jerry's hurting this morning over his wife. I understand. I know. I, I've got the days counted down to the minutes. I know what it'll be five after 11 today. But I can't just dwell on that. That's just part of my life. I dwell on the faith of God, the purpose of God, the reason I'm created to worship, to preach, to minister. Somebody come up to me and say, I'm so sorry that you've been so busy and you've been going. I said, it's okay. People are hurting and people have needs. Let's go minister while we can. Because when the day comes, they bury this old boy. I can't preach no more. I can't lay hands on nobody no more. I can't see miracles anymore except from heaven. I want to see them while I'm walking in this flesh. I want to I want to see people free. I want arms and legs to grow out, eyes to open up hair to grow on head hallelujah that was for your head I'm gonna keep mine like it is the hummingbirds love my head Whew. well here we go again 
Pastor Larry Souls. I just looked at my name on the screen. Remind me who I am, okay? I always remember the word is God talking to you. You ever say, Lord, I wish you'd speak to me? I'll tell you where to go look. Anywhere you want to in Proverbs. If you'll just go to Proverbs, you'll get more wisdom out of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. And Ecclesiastes is pretty powerful. Especially the third chapter, which will roll you up and show you something. I mean, it's amazing. It talks about time. To everything, there's a time and there's a season and there's a purpose. Those three things, time, season, purpose. And seasons people get deceived on. There's people that go from church to church going, well, I was there for a season. I was there for a season. Um, And they have gotten season-minded thinking that a season is a short term. A season's not short. A season is very, very long. When you go through winter, it's a season. You don't get in the middle of winter and say, I'm going to the middle of summer because I'm finished with this season. I don't want this season anymore. I'm ready for my new season. So I'm going to leave winter and I'm going to summer. Ha ha. Isn't that amazing? Now you're in summer. Guess what? Whatever happened in winter happened in summer. Ha! I'm going to the fall. <laughs> my season's over over there. Mm, now I'm in the fall. It's beautiful over here. It's colorful. Church, you can't take seasons and bounce around. The season is from the time you're born to the time you go back to where you come from. That is a season. And the season of your life is destined for purpose. The purpose of God. You were created by him for him. There's no other reason that you're even here. You're here because he wanted a part of himself to fellowship with. And that's where you came from. That's what I told him yesterday at the funeral. Pat would have you know one thing. You didn't start when you come out of the womb of a woman. You've been in God's loins all of eternity past. That's where you were. And God released you out of his own self so that he could fellowship with you. That's why a man and a woman are considered one in a relationship. That's why he relates his relationship with an individual as he does in marriage because it's covenant. Covenant means to cut, to shed blood, and to pour out and to give. Covenant. I've always been a one woman man and I'm the I'm as single as you can get, I guess. But if I ever, ever, ever have another woman, if it's a girlfriend, if it's a wife, I can tell you right now, it won't be but one. I don't know why people want two and three relationships. It's trouble. I've been counseling people for 40-something years, and you're the ones that's showing me, don't be like this. I'm going, okay, let me tell you how to get out of it. You're showing me not to ever get in it. Y'all think I'm kidding. Women are crazy. Not y'all. Y'all smart women. You're in church. I'm talking about the ones that ain't in church. Women walk up to you and hand you their phone number. Hey, give me a call. You need prayer? Yeah. Oh, boy. We can pray. I want to tell one woman. She gave me a phone number. She said, I want you to call me. And I was eating. And I looked at her number and I looked at her. And I said, well, we're here right now. I said, what you want to ask me? She said, well, I want you to call me. I said, well, if there's something you need prayer about, I said, you can just tell me right now. She said, well, will you just call me? No. I forgot to find out if she was rich. I know y'all always wonder why I talk about it. If I ever have another woman, I'm going to have me a rich one. And see, you think I want her money, don't you? I don't want no woman's money. I want her to have enough to not mess with mine. That's all I want. That's all I want. And she can keep it. I don't even care if she has more than I have. I hope she does. (laughs) Uh, All right, words out. 68-year-old man next month with a three-year-old baby. He's interested in a beautiful, godly, rich woman. If y'all see her, will you give her my phone number? Okay, thank you very much. Pastor, are you fishing for a woman? Yeah, beautiful, rich, and godly. And I don't care which one of them three you put in order. Godly, rich, and beautiful. Rich and beautiful and godly. I don't care. Just give me them three because that will be one. Are you all right? Isn't that scriptural? Three is one. All right, let me move on. I know you want to go eat. And if I don't hurry, we're not going to beat the Baptist to the restaurant. 
There's not one in Rock Hill, Oakman, I'm thinking this is the diner, but that's good food out there. I like the diner. You ever go to the diner? You have to watch out. People give you phone numbers out there. <laughs> All right, let me wind this down and let you go on faith. Faith always makes God's word prevail. But what is faith? Faith is a fact, but faith is an action. So when you say something, you have to act on it. You know, you don't just sit in a chair and just say it. If you're believing for something, you start preparing for it. You want a better car, and you've been believing God, and financially things have been rough on you? <laughs> you ask my wife. You know what my wife will tell you? Do you really, really, really want a car? A nice car? A new one? You want God to really bless you? You go take your old car, and you clean it up, and you wash it, and you check everything on it, and you make sure that car is right. And while you're doing that, you be going, Lord, I thank you for my new vehicle. And describe it, what you want. I know some people are going, you're crazy. It's, it's amazing how crazy works. Are you hearing me? If it works, I'm willing to be crazy. And so she started doing that. And the next thing you know, boom, a nice car, a nice Cadillac came in. First Cadillac we ever had. It was a gift to us. The man held up the golden keys and went right by my hand into my wife's. I said, you're missing God, you're missing God. So anyway, God is just so good. That's how she got that Cadillac. She confessed it, but boy, did she act on it. She got in that little Dodge coat and she scrubbed and she cried. I said, what are you doing? I'm believing God for nicer. And I'm letting God know I take care of what I got because if I will be faithful over what is little, my God will give me much. I said, look at that woman go. You see why I love that woman so much? She kept me saved. Well, she told me I better be or she'll kill me. So, it does, faith does. It, it, just take, it, it just makes the word prevail when you speak it, when you act on it. And when the word prevails over your thinking, oh my gosh. When your thinking process has done turned into nothing but the word is happening in your life, then faith is always the result and success is always the end results. Always. Are you hearing me? Listen. He says that the word prevails when we act on it. Where's that? James chapter 1 verse 22. He says, be you. I'm going to close on this one. Be you not hearers only and believe me being in the ministry I know hearers they really don't sow in they do give money but they just want to go here and they'll go to every convention I love conventions they'll go everywhere and they'll get sharpened up and, and they'll, they get everything but they never really go out and touch lives and minister to people they just go get and they go get and they want some, I want to see more miracles, they'll say. And, oh, I want to go where I can watch. The, I want to, I, and see, the whole time, God trying to get you to do the thing that you're sitting there gooking at. Mm -mm -mm -mm, man, I like all that. No, go do it. Are you hearing me? Okay, I told you I'd close on that. And this is part of the closing. I didn't understand anything about Christianity when I got born again. I didn't know that the Old Testament... And New Testament was two different books. I just thought they was one book. I didn't know they were 66. I didn't know that there was actually 72 books in the real original Bible, which Catholics still use. Are y'all okay? I didn't know any of that. I just knew I was going to hell. I got saved. I started getting in the Word, and it started working. And I just so got blessed that I started off around things about the power of words and faith and righteousness and who I am in Christ Jesus and being a Baptist and in a Baptist church and learning all that. I'm going, how come we don't talk about this? How come we don't preach this? How come we say tongues is of the devil when it's right here? Why? Why? I had so many questions and I got no answers except it's passed away. And my question, when? Oh, that's easy. When the apostles passed away well that's difficult because Ephesians 4 says we still have them which ones are you talking if you're talking about the 12 well one of them left early the other left the other 11 left later well, where are the apostles now in the church he gave apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers to perfect the church to go do the work of the ministry my job this is where I'll lose some of you today that's been visiting and I love you I'm not trying to run you off I'm just saying this is what makes people leave. My job is not to pat you on the back and tell you how sweet you are 
and thank you for your tithes. And as long as you come here and give and do nothing, I will be happy. Just give your money and sit. That's not my job. My job is to provoke you. My job is to take that shepherd's rod and put it around your neck, which stands for your will, and put the crook in it and give you a pull out of the world into the purpose of God. And now once that long shepherd's staff of that crook's around your neck and the pastor's pulling you out of that nasty crowd, it's for the purpose of God for you to go on with God, not to sit there and be a hearer only. If you're not doing it, what good is hearing it? When I went to Duke Power, six months old in Christ, thank God I was sitting under a spirit-filled Baptist preacher, Don Horton, laying hands on the sick, casting out devils. He said, you ought to do it on your job. Told the wrong guy. Boy, I'm telling you, I climbed up on that crane with long hair and I couldn't hardly read, didn't hardly know any scripture, but I started preaching about Jesus Christ and here they come. And about a hundred got born again. So for three and a half years with no credentials, no license, no ordination. Nobody said you can do it. For three and a half years, every day, I preached to 5,000 construction workers. And every time I preached, over 100 got saved. And it just, and it was rotating those 5,000 people. And I was just a plain, old, ordinary, sixth grade educated iron worker with a military combat experience. And I didn't know come here from Sikkim. And I'm standing out there preaching. And God is slaying them in the spirit. They're falling on the dirt. I'm not kidding you. On the job. It's like a big church service. And just boom, boom, boom. They're getting up speaking in tongues. One guy come running up to me. He said, oh God, I'm so scared. I'm going to die. I'm afraid of death. I'm so afraid of death. And he's a big man. And I said, Roy, what's wrong with you? He said, I don't know. I'm, just, I'm even scared to drive. And I said, in the name of Jesus, like that, hit his head. Well, he hit the dirt. Bam. And then two big guys picked me up and slammed me against the crane and drew their fist back. And I said, what? And they said, we saw you knock him down. <laughs> I said, man, I didn't do that. We saw it. And then he started hollering, let him go, let him go. And he was crying. And he got up and said, I don't know what he did to me, but I feel bold. And he was, wow. You know, he went and bought a tent and went preaching the gospel as an evangelist. Hello. I don't know if he got any credentials. Hello, I don't know where you get your credentials at and you've been told, you go preach this gospel. All the world, lay your hands on the sick. Not preachers, you lay your hands on the See, this is why people that visit want to leave because they're going to find out I ain't going to do your job. You do your job. Don't you call me and say, Pastor, they in trouble, you pray. I'm going to say back to you, they in trouble and you haven't prayed yet? Yeah, but you the pastor. As the pastor, my job is to provoke you to do it. You're trying to get me to do it. How long have you been in the hospital, lady? Two weeks. Where's your pastor? Oh, I have the most wonderful pastor. Well, where is he? I haven't seen him. You mean he doesn't come visit you? I haven't seen him, but oh, I love him. Well, how is it you would love a pastor that hasn't had anything to do with you? Oh, Half the church has been up here, and my friends have been up here, and I mean, and then she sends me a card. Pastor, I want to thank you for being the greatest pastor in the world. Do you know what any other Baptist preacher would have got if he hadn't went and visited the woman? The woman understood ministry. She was so touched by the body. And see, when you itch, you don't want the head, the pastor, to come down and scratch it. You want the hand to scratch itch if you haven't ever heard. If you get desperate, use your foot. But do you under, I'm closing. You understand? It's simple. Stand up on your feet because I can feel you scared. I'm going to keep you from getting to the restaurant. I can feel it. I hear your bellies growling. I think we're being outnumbered by Baptists in here. I can feel the pressure of wanting to eat. But I love to eat the word. And I do. I love the scroll. And I don't know why, but you know on Sundays, I'm never hungry for food, natural food. I hardly ever eat lunch after. I'll go out with everybody and they'll, why aren't you ordering? I, if I do order, I box it and take it home. I get so full of God that I'm just not hungry for food. Man doesn't live by bread alone. 
Watch this. But by what? Every word. Now, what does it say? That proceed. What's a proceeding word? What is it? It's already established. It's a finished thing. It's a done thing. Proceeding. And so we live by every word that is already established and set. So when you get to it, whatever it says, that's so. You've been raised in hell. You're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. You got saved. And then you got over here. And so, whoa, it says I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail above only and never beneath. I'm not used to that. I'm no good. I'm, I, I'm a worm. I'm not, no, no, no. You got to stop that. Shut up. That's the old man. That was the sinner. He's dead and gone. You're a new man in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your mind gets renewed. And all of a sudden, you're not depressed anymore. Woo! If I didn't have Jesus Christ, I'd be the most depressed man in the world. Hey, I'm telling you, God is your strength. He is your rock. He is your salvation. There ain't no preacher can set you free. Only Jesus Christ can set you and I free. The power of his word sets us free. Say this with me right now. I am what God says I am. And I can do what God says I can do. And I am what God says I am. And that is it. Yes, and don't you go anywhere else with that because it's the truth. It's the truth. Mm, God is good. All right. Woo, say this prayer with me. I'll let you go home. Say, oh God, I ask you to cleanse my heart. Touch my mind. And I'm giving you all that I am because I'm yours anyway. So I'm going to release me and I'm going to trust you with my life that's really yours anyway. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul, giving me peace, and now direction for your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. And if you meant that, you ought to just tell somebody you meant that prayer. It, yeah, it's important to confess it. It says, if you confess me before men, I confess you before angels. Amen. Well, I love you guys. God bless you. I got so much I want to keep talking about, but I know you're hungry. So God bless you. Y'all go do the word. Get some crosses and pass them out. Just hand them to people and say, Jesus loves you. You'll be surprised. Do the word. Thank you.